Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Inside Investing. This is the show that helps you level up your financial knowledge and sharpen your investing skills. I'm your host, Jason Natick, and today we've got a fantastic conversation. This one's actually coming to you live, and it's all about building a portfolio that can help you reach your own individual financial goals. Now, after all, there's countless different ways to build a portfolio, but with all of those different options, that may leave some with analysis paralysis. So we're gonna, we're gonna walk through some of the key decisions that can help you craft a portfolio that best suits your own individual needs. And later on, we're gonna open up the floor and start answering some of your hot burning questions that everyone in the audience has about portfolio construction and how to get started with investing. Without further ado, now this is actually a pleasure of mine. It's the second time I've had a conversation with this guest. Joining us here today is uh, Shrinathan Theramakulasingam. He's the head of national accounts and institutional sales at Vanguard Canada. Uh, great to see you again here, Shrinathan. Uh, welcome back. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me on the show, oh, Jason. It's yes. great to have a conversation again. 100%. Pleasures, pleasures, all ours, uh, all ours, and I know the audience is uh, is in great hands and is really going to learn a lot over the next hour. All right, so let's. Uh, I've got a couple questions to kind of tee us, tee us off here before we get into portfolio construction. Now, why do you think it's so important to build a portfolio that's tailored to your own individual goals and needs? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think when you think about saving and investing, there's so many options out there, right? And so I think. Uh, if you think about everything we do in life, if it's personal, it's something that we can drive towards. It's something that we can work towards. And so I think tailoring something to your personal needs makes it a lot easier because you hear something, whether it's your friends, you know, your in-laws, someone that you've known got into investing and they'll tell you something that doesn't sit right with you. And so to try to recreate that will probably in the long run uh, demotivate you in staying invested. So I think finding what's important to you, what your goals are is a great way of ensuring that you actually get the reward that you're investing towards. Yeah, the way I like to think about that is everybody's, you know, infamous for making, you know, kind of like New Year's resolutions, just general and, and kind of maybe bland. It's not something that you're passionate about. And guess what? Yep. 99% of them fall by the wayside. But if it's about you and and then maybe it's it's an opportunity to, to be interested in something, but also hold yourself accountable along, along the way because you've got a little personal buy-in. Exactly. I think that's the, the best way to look at it. All right, next here. So uh, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that new investors have when they're thinking about building and managing their own portfolios? Yeah, I think one thing that I hear, right, whether it's, you know, someone that I know personally, because a lot of people say, say, Sunanth, you're in investing, so you, you probably have a lot of answers on this. And so they'll come to me with different things. And I think the big issue, it's I liken it to what you might see in like the diet industry, right? There's just so much information out there. And so mm -hmm. you hear something from someone, it contradicts what someone else is saying. And as an end investor, similar to someone, you know, with the New Year's resolution of losing weight, it's hard to figure out what's important to them and how to get towards their end goal. And I think that's the biggest hurdle that I see from a lot of people. So you have this situation where someone will think investing is too hard and they don't know how to get into it. And so it's a little bit of that analysis paralysis that you mentioned, where when something's difficult in our mind, it's hard to take that first step. And usually, like going to the gym, getting to the gym is the hardest part, right? Making your first investment is the hardest part. And after that, it gets a little bit easier as things go on. And then there's the vice versa of that because there's so much information out there. You also get people who make it seem like it's very easy, right? And like a lot of things in life, if something's very, very easy or comes easy, it doesn't stay long. And so you get yourself into investments that you don't really understand. So I think those are the two things that I always see when it comes to people getting into investments and the hurdles that they'll actually face. All right. So that's our goal for today. We're going to thread the needle on, on trying not to keep it too simple, but trying not to overcomplicate things along the way. All right. So with that being said, let's get started with some key considerations around building a, a personalized portfolio. So, and let's not start uh, so well, actually, let's start at the beginning of the investing process. That's not just about buying investments, contrary to what some investors might think. Your first tip is for investors to create an investment plan that's tailored to their specific situation. Uh, so can you walk us through some of the key elements of a plan? Yeah, I think for, for me, when I think about an investment plan, it's it's almost signaling your intent, right? And it's like well, how I look at investing in general, it's a journey. It's not a destination. And so in getting a journey, you have to understand what you're comfortable with. And so 
I look at it from a variety of things, but a key element I would consider is what your goal is, what you're trying to get out of it, right? And for a lot of people, those goals are tied to certain time frames. So for me, I'd like to retire at some point. I love working at Vanguard, but at some point I'd like to retire. So that's my investment time frame. So I need to know what my time frame is. I know what my goal is, retirement, and how much risk I'm willing to take to get to that goal. So that's the third part, the risk tolerance. I could take a lot of risk that might push out my time frame. If I take a lot of risk and lose some money, I might have to work at Vanguard a little bit longer than initially intended. Um, so I think those are the three things you got to think about. But within that, Jason, what I would say is you might have different goals for different time frames, and that can live within a financial plan. And so that's a good way for us to say, okay, this is my goal to save money in the short term. I'm going to put certain type of investments there. This is my goal for retirement. So this is going to be the account that I don't look at every single day because I'm not going to need it for 30 years. And so when you have that type of investment plan, it gives you a guideline. It's kind of like a GPS telling you how to get to your destination on this journey. And so when you go off track, you can go back to that plan and say, hey, am I really off track or is this what was expected? Because day to day, when you come to investing, you see things like what we've seen in the last couple of weeks where it might seem like the markets are really starting to crumble and everyone gets worried. But if you're on your track to your investment plan, that shouldn't matter. That noise should go away over time. So I think those are the things that I would look at. What are your goals? What is your investing time frame? And what is your risk tolerance? And how does that make you feel, that risk tolerance? So a little maybe follow up around time frames. Like what do we think, uh, like we are, this investing plan is not intended to be like a set it and forget it type of instrument. What about like a, some sort of like check back? Is there an ideal frequency or kind of what yeah. would be kind of your, your, your thoughts or advice around, around you know, continuing to be you know, in, engaged in your own portfolio? Yeah, I think, it, and like most things that we're going to probably discuss, it, it really gets down to the personal preference, right? Um, but what I would always recommend to people who ask me that question is, in my opinion, I think you take life goals or life um, moments, big moments in your life, right? Whether you turn a certain age, whether you get a new job, whether you decide to start a family, things that you can look back and say, hey, this was a, a pretty important part of my life that important part of your life probably has changed your overall goals. So that's a good time to reevaluate your goals and your time frame. Uh, but otherwise, I think uh, something that I've seen a lot of individuals do and what I do myself is on an annual basis, I just look back and say, hey, are we sticking to it? And those annual check-ins, Jason, they don't have to be a long-term thing or, or a long time commitment. This is what we decided last year. We're still on pace. Let's keep going, right? And so I think those are two ways of looking at it whether it's an actual time frame, so every two years, every three years, or a big moment in your life, that is a good time to maybe check in and say, are my goals the same? Is my risk tolerance the same? All right, good point. All right, you, you touched on risk. So let's, uh, let's, let's shift our focus there a little bit. So some investors might have a tough time figuring out how much risk is appropriate for them. And after all, yep. risk sounds fine until you've experienced the downside of it. Do you have any rules of thumb uh, that we could use to help pin down the true, their you know, individual person's true risk tolerance? Yeah, I think the two that have helped me personally when I got into this industry, the first one is really just investor questionnaires that you'll see in major financial institutions. I know T TD Direct has one as well, and that's a good way of just answering questions to gauge what part of your portfolio should be more equities, which, you know, just for the audience, that's usually going to be your riskier part of your portfolio or fixed income, right, which is going to be a little bit less risk associated. And so that gives you a good idea. What you'll probably hear me say during this um, conversation as well, you've probably heard other people in this industry say is, I'll say something like a 60-40 portfolio. So that means 60% stocks, 40% fixed income. If I were to make that an 80-20 portfolio, 80% equities, 20% fixed income, that'd be a little bit more risky. So I think those questionnaires help you get a good gauge. Another one that I've seen uh, individuals use is take something like 110 and take away your age. So if you were 20 years old, 110 minus 20 gives you about 90%. That should be your equity allocation. The rest would be fixed income. So these are good points to start off. Uh, but as you kind of touched on it, Jason, what I tell people who are looking to investing is how you feel during investing is different than what the practice or what the, the theory tells you, right? The theory tells you you don't have to have emotions, but a lot of people face investing very differently from others. And so if you're constantly feeling anxious and you're feeling like you need to check your investments on an ongoing basis, that might be a sign that maybe you have a lower risk tolerance than you initially thought, 
right? Because some of these things are very broad in nature, but your experience with investing will probably help decide that, you know what, Stranathan, I actually need to take less risk because I'm always checking my portfolio. Because let's keep our goals in mind, right? We want to get to a point where we have financial freedom, whether it's in retirement or not. And if you're constantly feeling like you're taking away from that, you're losing your freedom of today. And so I think that's a good good pulse check to say, maybe I, I want to take on a little less risk and my risk tolerance is actually lower than I initially thought. And if you're constantly checking things, there might be maybe a more apt to kind of get away from your plan at, at some point too, and actually make decisions that aren't kind of beneficial to the long term as well. What do you, what do you think about that? That's uh, entirely correct, Jason. I think some of the worst decisions I've made in my life were when emotions were high, right? And so I think uh, you put yourself in those positions where emotions are high because you're looking at the market, everyone's panicking. Um, that could probably lead to some um, bad decisions. You know, so the same thing I tell to some of my, my teammates here is if you're writing an angry email, don't send it. Take the day off and then look back. Same thing with your investments. If you're looking, you're very, very stressed, Give it a day, right. give it a week, come back and look at your investments. I think you might be in a different mindset in a week's time. Right, and we're not living in a vacuum here. This is your money, this is your retirement. Obviously, it means a lot to each and every one of us, but being prepared with a plan to help take that emotion out of the out of the equation is, is, a, is a good tip. So, all right, so let's move on to that second tip of yours here, and that concerns the choice between individual stocks and bonds or investment funds like ETFs or mutual funds. You suggest thinking about them on a spectrum of time and confidence. Uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so what I would say to this is it's, it's going back to, so we talked about the part of investment plans that you should consider, right? And then once you have that investment plan, what type of vehicles are you going to use? Uh, so what do I mean by that? So for investors, there's a lot of things. You can buy individual stocks, you can buy ETFs, you can buy mutual funds. Uh, you can buy a basket of ETFs that are essentially an all-in-one portfolio. How I look at this is all of those things, like purchasing anything in life, requires a certain amount of research, a certain amount of confidence. I just recently uh, bought a car. took me some time to understand what that car can offer me as a, as a vehicle and what I should be looking for. And I think if you're looking at something... There's a, there's a spectrum of the amount of knowledge you need and the amount of research you need to, to do and the amount of ongoing management that you need to have. And so for me, on one end, you have these all-in-one portfolio solutions, right? That's going to take a little bit less knowledge, a little bit less uh, research that's necessary, and ongoing management is going to be lower because those portfolios are going to constantly stick to your risk tolerance. We did the questionnaire. We found out we're a 60-40 investor. Now we're buying a 60-40 all-in-one portfolio. It's a pretty easy conversation. Now, you want to make your own portfolio of 6040. You can buy different ETFs and mutual funds. That's going to take a little bit more research and knowledge to figure out exactly which ETFs you want and which mutual funds you want. But those ETFs and mutual funds, what are they? They're a pool of securities. So if you have more time, more research, and more confidence, you can actually go do that same thing that we talked about, but use individual stocks or individual bonds. And so that's how I look at that spectrum. You might end up with the same outcome. You might end up with a better outcome or a, a worse outcome, but it's the amount of effort you're putting into it. So for investors who are feeling a little anxious and just want something easier with less time and knowledge and research, I think that's where you would lean to something like an all-in-one portfolio. Someone who's a little bit more um, investment savvy as they get into this industry, they might want to create something with stocks and bonds, individual stocks and bonds themselves. So that's how I would look at that spectrum, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes makes great sense. Now, what do we think to the idea of like we've got this money that we're investing for a longer period of time, you know, based on our own individual life life situations? And what about you hear about some people having? I hesitate to call it play money because it's we're not nothing's here for play. It's all for keeps. But they've got another pool of money that they that they that they've decided they're able to take a different set of you know risks and a different set of allocations with. How do what do, what do we what do we think about that kind of concept? Yeah, and I think that's something that we see with every type of investor, whether it's an end investor, whether it's the advisors we talk to, or even you know some institutions. You know, to your point, play money is probably not the right. This is not monopoly, right? At some point, uh, you got to yeah. pay the bank back. Um, but the concept of having a core part of your portfolio, right, and an explore part of your portfolio is something that's been around for a very long time. You know, the majority of most people's portfolios in that world goes back to the good old 80-20 rule, right? I'm sure most things in life are 
20% of your effort, 80% of the results. And so you would keep 80% of your portfolio in that core. This is your more diversified number. And then that 20% can go into your explore. I would say it goes back to your risk tolerance. How much of that 20% are you willing to lose? If you're willing to lose all of that 20%, then I think you can take on a little bit more riskier assets there. If even in that 20%, you don't want to lose a lot of it, you know, it's maybe a little bit more of a higher risk type of asset class, but it won't be something that is completely new to you, right? And so that's kind of how we've seen that play out. Most investors have that kind of conversation. I can tell you myself, I, I hold certain um, pooled vehicles, but I also have certain stocks that I, I really like and I want to hold. Uh, but I understand that's going to be a very small part of my overall portfolio. All right, thanks for the insight. All right, we're going to take a quick pause with the questions here for Sananthan, and I'm going to actually get the viewers involved here. We've got a poll question. The poll is going to read, which types of investments do you hold in your portfolio? Now, we've got four answers. Pick the pick what uh, suits you best. Are you, are you A, only individual investments like stocks and bonds? Or is it B, do you mostly hold individual investments, but you've got some investment funds as well? Or C, only investment funds? Or D, we've got mostly investments funds with some individual investments mixed in there as well. So go ahead and cast your votes on the screen. Uh, we're gonna continue on with our questions uh, for Shananthan and then uh, we'll reveal the answers in just a moment and follow up on that. All right, so next question here is, what about alternative investments such as, you know, cryptocurrencies as just one, one specific example, where might they fit into this core and explore approach that you just described? Yeah, I would, and you know, I would say for me personally, that that would definitely be in the the explore conversation. I, I you know, I do talk to a lot of uh, colleagues and and further investors who kind of put that a little bit more in the core than I would say I'm comfortable with from a risk perspective. But cryptocurrencies are are, are unique, right? And there there's a lot to potentially like about it. Um, but it goes back to that spectrum of the knowledge you have in there, the amount of time you can to do research it. Um, so for me, when I look at something like a cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin or any of the other ones, Ethereum, I don't have the time or the research or the, the confidence in there to put it to more than just the explore part of my portfolio. Um, this is where I think a plan also comes into play, right? If you are looking to invest to a retirement, you have to ask yourself, what happens when you get to retirement and you don't have any money? And if you think there's a likelihood of that with the volatility that comes with an asset class like cryptocurrency, that may not make sense for anything beyond just the explore part of your portfolio. So, uh, interesting Jason, interesting I, uh, way to put it. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, anything can fit and anything can't fit, right? It really comes back to your individual your horizon and your investment goals, right? And so if that is at jeopardy, then you have to ask yourself, does that make sense to be that big of an allocation or big of a part of your portfolio? And it comes back to the individual approach that you mentioned earlier, right? It's that time and that desire to be engaged. If, you, if, if, my, if I only want to dedicate a few hours a month or a few hours, a, a, you know, you know every, every few months, then it's going to then, you know, dictate you know, what investments, what, what structure my portfolio is going to have, right? That's exactly it. The other Perfect. rule I, I would say that I, I look at personally is when I invest is, can I explain to my wife why we've lost some money, right? And if I can't explain to my wife why my son might not be able to go to university, then it's probably something I'm going to stay away from. Um, and it just makes it easier for me because it's the onus. It keeps me responsible because I'm investing on behalf of myself and, you know, something bigger. Yeah, you know what? That's a great rule of thumb. I'm going to write that one down. That might be, uh, I could maybe apply that to uh, to out, outside of investing ideals as well. So uh, can I explain That's what fair. I've done to those the significant others around me? So yeah, nice point. All right, so I've got the poll results actually up on the screen here. We should be able to see them on, on your end as well, Sir Nathan. It's, once again, which types of investments do you hold in your portfolio was the question. The uh, if you can believe it or not, the, the top question with about 43% was mostly individual investments with the sprinkling of, of funds and then kind of the more uh, balanced approach with investment funds with, with stock coming in, you know, just under 29%. Does this, uh, does this surprise you from what you're seeing or is this kind of, uh, kind of what you expect from, uh, from, you know, from, from, your, from, the, from the audience? No, I think this is uh, actually quite in line with what we've seen in the industry too, right? So if we're looking at, you know, do-it-yourself investors or investors on on platforms like TDDI, we are seeing the majority of assets in individual 
investments, mm -hmm. uh, but with a, a, a very strong growth with investment funds over the last couple of years. I think simplicity is probably the big part into why we're seeing that, but um, you know, people have individual preferences and there's this, there's this value of recognizing a name, right? When you have a fund mm -hmm. that could be a lot of things, but if you see a certain name, um, it, it does make you feel a little bit more comfortable. So yeah, this is very much in line with what we've seen. And likely too, especially for people just getting out, just getting started. They maybe they're not familiar with ETFs. They may have heard of mutual funds. Maybe ETFs aren't aren't in their wheelhouse. But it, as you become more seasoned and and your ability to get some diversification, that that might uh, that might grow kind of the, uh, the the share within your wallet, if you will. Exactly. All right, great. So let's let's continue with the questions here. Uh, so. I just mentioned diversification, so a nice, nice uh, segue here. That brings us to our, our third tip. Uh, the U.S. stock market saw major volatility uh, over the August long weekend uh, here in Canada, and that had some investors rushing to sell. Uh, what are some habits you think can help investors ride out some volatility without hurting their returns? Yeah, I think it starts with going back and revisiting your plan. I think that's why... You know, I wanted to start the session with the plan and your investment goals because it's hard to make a decision if your investment goals and your investment plan is still on track, right? And so I think that's the first thing that is important to keep in mind. I know for someone like me who's very analytical, I, I go back and I look at what it means to not be in the market, right? And so there's a lot of research that's been done that shows usually when you sell, the panic selling ends up happening um, at a most inopportune time. So you end up getting out of the market and you don't get back the returns from the market by staying invested. So that's the importance of staying invested. Seeing it in, in terms of numbers, um, it, it becomes really shocking. You know, we see a big drop off when you sell off just because of panic selling. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I would say to help with that mitigation is, so there's the immediate feeling once you see it, what would you do? Go back to your plan, see if you're on track. The one way to maybe limit the amount of uh, stress is having diversification in your portfolio overall, right? And so what do I mean by that? Not having one specific type of uh, stock. You know, I wouldn't want to put all my money in one stock. You're putting all your eggs in one basket, it's the old adage. Or having multiple different asset classes because usually what we see in portfolio construction over several decades, if not centuries at this point, is having different types of investment vehicles in a portfolio help mitigate some of that volatility. So you're less likely to make a, a panic sell, right? And so I think that's a big part of having that conversation. And you know, I think what you got to look at this from your own emotional impact. So going back to that risk tolerance, if you catch yourself in these situations, maybe this is a conversation that you need to have with yourself of maybe you want to take on a little bit less risk, right? Because it's not in line with doing, it's not in line with the way you, you experience the investment market. And so those are the three things I'd probably consider in that world. All right. Now, before we get to our next question, we're going to, we're going to get that interactivity. We're going to keep that, that theme going. Are we going to take a quick pause this time? We've got a trivia question for the audience. Uh, that trivia question reads, what percentage of Gen Z Canadians or those that are aged 18 to 25 as of 2024 have started investing? Is it A, 14%? Is it B, 35%? Is it C, 62 or D, 74%? Uh, percent? Cast your vote and we'll reveal, the, we'll reveal the answer in just a moment. I guess maybe I'll have you kind of uh, frame the discussion. What do you, where do you think that, uh, that number is gonna lie based on your experience or nothing? Um. If I were to guess, I'm gonna, I'm struggling between B and C. Mm -hmm. So I'll say this: I, I've, you know, I, I have a niece who's in this Gen Z generation. I think investing has become a lot cooler than it used to be when I was that age, right? And I think uh, maybe the way we used to compare Pokemon cards is the way people now compare investment portfolios. And so I'm leaning towards 35 percent, maybe 62. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, the way I like to think about it, you know, how it's, I don't know if I'd label it cool yet, but it's one of those things like you can get, there's financial influencers out there, whether, you know, you, know, you need to trust your sources and know who you're listening to. But, you know, people younger, the younger generation is, has got access to a lot of information on their phones, whether or not it's on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube and things like that. So, and, and, and you're seeing a growing trend of people, uh, you know, creating investing, investing content and we're along there with them. So hopefully it's, 
uh, you know, spurring people to be engaged with their uh, with their own finances and their own investing outcomes. So yeah, 35, 62, I think I'm right in, the, in, in between B and C with you there as well. Um, all right, you know what? Let's uh, let's we've got a, a quick response from the audience on the trivia. So let's just not take any, let's not take time here. Let's jump in and see exactly what those results came in at. And we've got uh, actually the highest uh, the highest amount from a uh, response perspective is actually fourteen percent. So that would have been uh, I guess that would have been A on that. But we do have thirty five and sixty two percent have do look like they are the the second highest respondents. So. Yeah, it's seventy four percent is uh, is what is what wow. that is. That credit that you were uh, that you were trying to give to Gen Zs earlier, we can we can continue to uh, to lavish them with the praises of being uh, being engaged investors and engaged in their own own financial futures. So so good for them. All right, next question. Let's keep let's keep this moving here. Uh, next question we've got for you is: uh, Some investors might see how well the S and P five hundred index has performed this year and question why they should bother diversifying beyond that. What's your take there? So now with that question and then married with the fact that 74% of Gen Z Canadians are starting to invest. Yeah, you see, this is where I think it's a little bit like, um, I tell my friends, anytime you get into any sort of sports, the, the team that you end up cheering for is a team that's winning at the time, right? So I have a lot of friends who watch uh, right. you know, American football and they're, they're big Seattle Seahawks fans because they started watching football when the Seahawks were winning Super Bowls. I think that's kind of happening now with investments. So Gen Z investors right. are looking at something like the S&P 500. It's done really well. And so that's their favorite team. That's their favorite investment. And so uh, my, my concern is when you do this long enough, you start to realize uh, everything falls out of love after a while, right? And you just have to go back to 2000 and 2010, which I think a lot of these Gen Z investors would have been toddlers or um, in elementary school. That was a lost decade for the S&P 500. And so why I'm saying that is it kind of highlights the need for diversification. Not to say, you know, bet against the S&P 500, obviously having uh, a portfolio consisting of the 500 largest U.S. companies is never a bad idea, but it does show the importance of having some diversification around that, right? Whether it's other type of equity investments, so international here in Canada, uh, emerging markets, or even some fixed income into your portfolio. So you can fall in love with something that's worked for a very long time, but when it doesn't work, it becomes mm -hmm. the issue that you, you might see. And so that's the concern, right? 74% of Gen Z investors are now in, involved in, in investing, but they might be falling in love with something that's worked for the last decade that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for the next decade right and so we have to prepare ourselves for a world where the us may not lead that's kind of what i would think about overall all right to continue your football analogy right in the investing market if we're if we're all band bandwagon hoppers we're going to make some money along the way but if we throw a pick on the goal line in the super bowl you know that's and if yeah. we're not properly diversified then you know guess what then our uh, where our pocketbooks could be hurting as opposed to just, uh, you know, just feeling some uh, consternation with, with the team, so. Exactly. All right, great. So uh, next one here, moving on in, you know, run, running down the list of your tips here. Uh, your fourth tip is, uh, is continuing that, di that diversification theme, and that's to avoid diversification in a portfolio. So I like the plan words there. Uh, what is that and how can investors avoid it? Yeah, so I think, so, you know, we just talked about um, S&P 500 getting a lot of love and, and there's a variety of ways of investing in the S&P 500, uh, whether it's a mutual fund and an ETF. What I what I see and why I think I want to flag diverse, diversification, it's hard word to say, is that a lot of people think like diversification just essentially means ha adding more to your portfolio. But you want to add more of different things, right? You're, you're building out a plate of food donuts are great but your entire portfolio can't be more donuts right you need to have your meats your potatoes your veggies and so you want to make sure what you're adding to your portfolio similar to adding to your plate are different things so you can't have four of the same s p 500 etfs or you end up buying another etf that might be us equity and so now your portfolio might have five six investments but all six of those investments are really coming back to the same thing that you're investing in the u.s economy and so that is the concept that we've seen with end investors with with um advisors with institutions to be honest so everyone is very much fallible into this type of concept they think more is always better but sometimes you have to take a look at that and say 
what is this adding to my portfolio? And if it isn't adding something new, then does it make sense to be added to the portfolio? So diversif uh, diversification is, is a concept that I think is happening more and more. So don't have four S&P ETFs that may not make sense for, to your portfolio. Take a look at that and see what you're actually adding to the actual portfolio. And when we're thinking yeah. about either diversification or diversification, however, whichever topic, what do we think, or how do we, how do you uh, suggest that we make sure that we still have the right breakdown? That you've not, you've your your portfolio through the ups and downs and growth of certain sectors hasn't over rotated to to, to heavy into like the tech sector or something like that. How, how would how would we how would we avoid that? Yeah, I, what I'll say honestly, sometimes it can be hard to avoid, and I think what. Um, one good way is, and I think a lot of um, a lot of fund firms or asset managers or ETF companies have done is there'll always be a fund prospectus or a fund fact that shows you what you're actually invested in. At the end of the day, I'm seeing more and more platforms actually do a good job of breaking down your investments to different sectors, um, and then hmm. take a look at that and say, is this now putting me away from my end outcome? It doesn't necessarily mean you'll have an action you know sometimes we've seen this naturally happen as well right more and more technology has been part of major indices because tech firms are growing faster than non-tech firms um that doesn't necessarily mean you have to sell out of your portfolio but it's something to just keep in mind of and so that goes back to those check-ins whether it's on an annual or a biannual basis or a lifetime or a life uh, achievement basis i think you want that's when you want to revisit these type of conversations as well mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this as a as a kind of a technique. If it's if it's working for somebody that's a professional in the industry, then you can make it work for yourself on your own scale. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to your your fifth tip here, and that's knowing when to buy the dip. So obviously we can't know how an investment will perform in the future, and how uh, but how might investors want to think about buying the dip with their investments as they build their portfolios. Yeah, I think so. We've done some research on on buying the dip and what, what that means, right? So I think the first thing I would say is there's this instinctive reflex that I think is happening in the market where someone says, "Well, buy the dip because now it's down." You know, you are already going to buy it; it's a little bit cheaper, so let's buy some more of it. I think it's important to look at if anything has changed. That's the first question you have to ask yourself: Is, is there a reason for? The portfolio to be down is it just the broad market being down right and so is that the reason why you want to do that um and the second thing is to think about is it does it make sense to reallocate this money to the parts that are underperforming in your portfolio or other parts of your portfolio so i think anytime where you see the market sell off and there's an opportunity to buy the dip or to buy more of investments i think you have to ask yourself is this in line with your plan and if it's in line with your plan then there's a reason to buy some more. If it's not in line with your plan, I think that's a conversation to be had around how do you reallocate some of this money to other parts of your portfolio, right? Um, what I would say overall is it shouldn't, in my opinion, it shouldn't really push you to put more money into it. So if you're already going to invest, then for sure, keep to your investment plan that you have, right? Um, but I wouldn't, all of a sudden use uh, a pullback in the market to take money from another part of your investment goals, whether it's some money that you had just on the sidelines or whether it's for a short-term goal. I wouldn't change your goals for the dip. I would just ensure that's within your overall plan. That's kind of how I would look at it. There, It's very tempting, right? The same way it's tempting yeah. to sell out when the market's going wrong. On the other side, it's tempting, oh, something's on sale. You know, I have to remind myself to not buy suits. A suit's on sale. That doesn't mean I should buy another suit, right? I might have enough suits as is. And so I think that's part of the part of don't be tempted to put money into action that wasn't part of your overall plan. You know what? This Maybe this is me. I like to keep things simple, but analogies, you know, tend to do that for me. We've got buy the dip. How do we contrast buy the dip when it's right for you with the, the term that maybe a lot of people have heard as well is don't catch a falling knife. How do we contrast those two together? Yeah, that's a that's a good that's a good uh, question. I think um, what I can say is the knife is sharper when it's less diversified, right? And I think I would look at an edge of a knife, kind of like one one point. If you are very diversified, it's harder to say you're catching a knife, 
right, a falling knife because there's so many edges to it. There's so many possible investments. I think um, how I look at, in my mind, Jason, is fo- calling, uh, catching a falling knife is really sticking onto a specific investment and buying more and more of it because you don't want to sell out of it. I think buying a dip is more of a broad market conversation. That's how I look at buying the dip. Um, so it's different for different people, but you can you can kind of see them as two different sides of the same coin. Um, but there are some fine differences there. That's well put. Yeah, and, and that that clarifies it nicely and ties it back to the tips that you've been uh, even sharing with the group all along. All right, so now we're going to pivot and we're going to take some questions live from the audience. Our first question comes to us comes to us from Stephen. And Stephen wants to know, uh, what are some rules of thumb for figuring out how many investment products an investor might need in their portfolio? That is a, a good question, Stephen. I think the way I look at that is what parts of the market do you want to be invested in, right? So, you know, when we've constructed portfolios here, we look at there's probably seven parts of the market you want to be invested in U.S. equities, Canadian equities, international equities emerging market equities. So that's on the equity side and on the fixed income side, something in Canada, something in the U S and something globally. And so for me, that comes down to seven numbers, but for, for you as an investor, you may not want to be invested in some of those markets. So where do you want to have some skin in the game? It's probably another way to re question that or reframe that. And if you want to have skin in the game in four different places, maybe four different investments seem like a good place to start off. And then you might have more time, going back to the time and the research capabilities to say, hey, actually in this one place, I want to have more slices of it. So within the US, I want to have more tech and that gives you an opportunity to grow. But a starting place might be, where do you want to have some skin in the game? All right, nice point. Yeah, it's all about the individual investor, but yeah, the the, the point of the seven sectors is, is, is well taken. All right, next comes to us from Amy. Amy wants to know, should a long-term investor generally prioritize earning income over capital growth? Yeah, that's a, that is a good question. Um, so it, it, in my opinion, I would, I personally prioritize capital growth, right? And so what I mean by that is just your portfolio growing over time instead of getting some dividends on a more frequent basis. But there is some psychology to this, right? And so I'd say, I'm saying my opinion, because I, I know a lot of friends who invest who like the idea of having dividends. So I think it's yeah. it's going back to the gym uh, analogy of what makes it easier for you to do it over and over again, right? The best exercise is the one that you're willing to be consistent with. So if there's a conversation to be had of seeing dividends in your portfolio and that revitalizes you, energizes you to invest more and continue to your plan, there's a, there's a very strong case to be made there. But over the long run, the compounding ability of capital growth does play a part in it, right? And so if you want to take the emotions out, that makes a lot of sense. But if there is an emotional tie to investing and the income gives you that emotional tie, I would say there's an opportunity to start building your portfolio to pay dividends on an ongoing basis. And kind of where you're at in those life events, like you talked about earlier, your life cycle of investments. Are you really close to retirement? Are you in retirement? And how important are those dividends going to be for you to, you know, maintain your standard of living, things like that. So, uh, you know, every investor is going to be different and every investor is going to be different as they mature and as they grow uh, through their own investing life cycle, for sure. Exactly. All right. Next question. We've got Veronica. Veronica's up. She wants to know, I have money to invest. Is it better to dollar cost average or invest all at once? Yeah, it's uh, actually this is uh, something we did some research at Vanguard. And what we ended up finding out is if you have money to invest, invest it whenever you have the money. Right. And so mm-hmm. what do I mean by that? If you did have a lump sum for whatever reason, an inheritance, it makes sense to invest it when you have it. Um, but that wouldn't that doesn't mean you should delay investing to get a lump sum and then invest, if that makes sense, Jason, right? So if you're getting paid on a biweekly basis, don't just put money aside as cash and then lump sum invest it. Whenever you have access to the money, if it's part of your investment plan, it makes sense from a return perspective in the research we've done that you're better off to start investing whenever you have that money. And so that's kind of the, the short answer. In some cases, it would be invested all at once. In some cases, it would be dollar cost average because you have that available funds to you. And, you know, I don't have the stat like offhand, but 
if, if somebody's looking to just do lump sums all at once, if they're effectively trying to time the market. And I'm sure, you know, you've got experience with yeah. this. And I know from my own investing experience, th there's nothing harder than to time the market. Because if you time the market, you're missing something like, like I, once again, I don't want to throw a number out because I don't know the number, but it's it's you're missing most of the of the of the potential gains exactly. if, you all, if all you're doing is trying to pick the right exact moment. So, um, okay, moving on to our next question. This one is is in the hopper from Chris. Chris wants to know, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, yeah, tr uh, Chris, we're saying, uh, in your opinion, how often, if at all, should a long-term investor be selling their investments? That is. Um... That's a good question. I think obviously context matters, Chris. What I would say is it would coincide with your evolving goals. And what I mean by that is it makes sense to sell an investment to then buy something that's more in line with your goals, right? So, you know, maybe your risk tolerance has changed. Uh, for example, I would want to sell out of some of my equities to then go into my fixed income. But otherwise, um, if you're having a, a time horizon that is very long in, in, in duration and you have a goal that is something of retirement, it, it becomes really hard to, to justify selling it because there are some costs associated with selling investments, right? So from my perspective, unless I'm adjusting to my investment plan, I would probably not, um, not be selling investments for the sake of selling investments. You want to stick to your goal at the end of the day and your plan. And if you're not trading in your TFSA or your RSP, you know, this is a very loaded question, but you need to be thinking along the lines of what are the taxable implications as well as do I have capital gains or uh, losses yeah. and how can that be, you know, how can I best take advantage of those uh, either side of that coin too? So exactly. Yep, nothing, nothing happens in a vacuum. Um, all right. So next question comes to us from Stephanie. Stephanie wants to know, it doesn't make sense to consider my pension as fixed income dollars and invest the large bulk of my investment dollars that I don't foresee needing in the next 20 years. Let's say she's giving the the, 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 the figure of 100% in equities or ETFs. What are your thoughts to that, Samantha? That is, that is a good question. I think um, what I'd say, Stephanie, is I, in my, so I guess everyone has mental blocks and, and mental, um, thought processes investing. I, I am not too dissimilar from you, Stephanie, from looking at my pension as a certain long-term goal and getting and supplementing that with as much growth as possible, right? And so um, where I am in, in my investment timeline with my goals, I can see a case to invest a little bit more from a equity perspective for the time being. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, is your pension or is your RSP a defined contribution or a defined benefit, right? Because if it's a defined contribution, there's a chance you may not actually have as much money at the end of the, the investment horizon as a defined benefit. So I know it's a little technical there, but that's something that mm. I would probably consider. But uh, I think that's a, a decent way of looking at it, of having what you have as your reserve or your, your pension as more of a consistent component of your investment world, and then your equities being your growth component of it. Now, with that, like every decision that will come with a little bit more volatility. So you have to ask yourself, Stephanie, are you okay with that volatility that comes with a hundred percent equity portfolio? And if the answer is yes, I think you might have solved your your own question there. I think that that it's a good way of trying to look at your total portfolio. And I think that's what I would encourage a lot of investors to do. Don't look at every single account as its own. Look at it from a holistic perspective. And I think Stephanie's done a good job of looking at that here. All right, nicely done, Stephanie. Uh, I'm gonna pull that cash reserve thread. A little bit. Um, now we talk about portfolio construction and percentages of fixed incomes versus equity and ETFs. Is there kind of an ideal percentage of your overall investable in investable assets that 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 we would think about maybe having in cash, either to act on a good opportunity that's in line with your objectives or to that you might need for a rainy day? Kind of what do we what do we um, what would be some a, like a rule of thumb there if, if there is one? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's the context, right? So. Um, we just talked about timing the market. So holding it in reserve to find an opportunity is a little bit waiting to time the market. So I, I, I would probably stay away from that. That detracts from your long-term goals. So if you're looking at it from a long-term goal perspective, by doing that, you are effectively timed to try to time the market, which we know is very difficult and often is a fruitless endeavor. Um, the amount of cash in your portfolio, I think 
really does tie to your goals, right? And so right now, you know, with my son, for example, he, he's very young. I don't have a lot of cash in his portfolio. We don't need it for the next little bit. But as he's approaching going to university, I can see a reason of a short-term goal in mind to increase my cash allocation. You know, rule of thumbs, we've seen a lot of investors have that in the 2 to 5% number. I think that's more of not a cash investment, that's more of a liquidity investment. You have a lot of instances where you need some money on hand and you don't want to sell out of the markets. Um, if there's more of those, then I think you'd probably be close to 5%. But if there's a rare instance where you actually need cash on hand, then you know something closer to 0-2% uh, probably makes uh, sense for you. Okay. All right. Something, just something to consider for your own individual situation. All right. Next question comes to us from Danica. Danica wants to know, how can an investor figure out which investment account they should prioritize making their their contributions and deposits into? Yeah, that is a that is a good question. I I I would say, Danica, this is very much on your personal um, situation, right? And so, strategies that I've seen, maybe I'll just speak to strategies I've seen. Jason is uh, you know I've yeah. seen a lot of individuals prioritize it, maxing out their RRSP. Right, and using the tax refund, should you be in a higher income, using the tax refund to then reinvest into your TFSA. So I think that's one that's that's worked a little bit. Um, I, I've seen other individuals actually take the opposite of that, just put all their money in the TFSA. It's less money today, but it could be more tomorrow because of the tax implications. And so there's different conversations to be had on where you think you are in terms of your current earnings. Because that's the big question, right? Where you think you, if you, you think your current earnings are probably the highest you're going to be in your career, there's an opportunity to take advantage of tax um, benefits of the RSP. And if it's not, I think TFSA. So those are the two prevailing thoughts that we've seen. It is very hard to opine on figuring out what's best for any individual um, without knowing all the other circumstances. But that's those are two things I would consider. Yeah, well put. And, you know, one thing I can add to that as well is that, uh, you know, nice, and, and nice enough is that if we're in the learn section on Web Broker and we're, we're this time choosing the master classes section, we actually have a, uh, a master class that, uh, that our instructors teach on considerations between choosing between RSPs and TFSAs and kind of the benefits and drawbacks of both. So uh, if you've uh, if you've got uh, if that's part of your own continued learning objectives uh, there, um, Danica, then. Uh, yeah, come join us for, for a future session along that. All right, let's keep going and, and with, the, with these questions. Our next question comes to us from Sam. Uh, Sam asks us, how should I start building a portfolio if I'm, an, if I'm not entirely sure of what my investing goal is? That is a, that's a good question, Sam. I think what I would say is that um, I think not having a goal is a goal in itself, right? And so you you almost look at it from a what do you what are you trying to achieve? Or I guess that would be your goal. I would say if you're not sure what your investing goal is, I would reframe that in what is important for you. Right. And so is important is tomorrow more important than today? then that kind of sets you up on whether you want to go on to a more dividend or more income approach, which is more money coming in today on an ongoing basis versus just capital growth. Um, that would be the best way of looking at it. I would also then just take the goal out. Maybe there's a risk component. You look at it from a risk tolerance. Maybe that questionnaire helps you figure out your risk tolerance and you find a portfolio that's already constructed for you and it just gives you an avenue to save on an ongoing basis. Those are two routes I would probably look at. Ask yourself, is it tomorrow, today or tomorrow that's most important in, in your head? Or is it just more, I want to go with a tolerance component of it and I just want to be in the market. Um, and that's just an easy way to get in, forgetting the goal. The goal will come as, as different life achievements or life uh, milestones happen. That's very sage of you. I was thinking that when you were starting your answer, I was like, that's like a Yoda level Jedi answer. <laughs> the goal, the, not having a goal, it's a goal itself. That was, uh, that was, that was well done. <laughs> I like it. Uh, okay, so next question. Another one from Veronica. Thanks for being uh, being engaged with us in these questions here. Uh, is saying, what are asset allocation ETFs? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we're quite famous for these, but really 
it's a lot of words, right? Asset allocation, what does that really mean? But it's, you know, when people look at asset allocation, what they're asking is that going back to that 60-40 versus 80-20 portfolio. The question is, what is your risk tolerance, right? And what we've learned in, in looking at the Canadian market, looking at our peers in the U.S. and Australia and the U.K. is sometimes people want to get invested. Maybe similar to the question we just had with Sam, they don't know what their goal is. And so they just want to have something to invest in without doing all that research and figuring out what parts need to be part of their portfolio. So it's an all-in-one solution. So I mentioned earlier also, Jason, that I would look at seven parts of the market that I think are important. We essentially took all those seven parts and put them into one asset, uh, one ETF. So instead of you buying seven different ETFs, you can buy one ETF all in once um, at um, at a low cost. And so that is easy for people to get into investing as they're trying to figure out what their goals are, as they're trying to figure out what their horizon is. It's a simple solution. It takes away the research, it takes away the building that confidence. So I think it's a starting point for some investors. It's the ending point for others. And it really depends on where you are in your journey. All right, next question. This one comes to us from Zach. Zach wants to know, uh, in your opinion, how much should investors consider market forecasts when they're building out their own portfolios? And he's seeing headlines around tech stocks and maybe even a tech bubble. Uh, and he's wondering if he should build his portfolio more conservatively based on well, he's based on those news articles. Yeah, that's a good question. In my opinion, I would put not so much. Uh, weight into market forecasts, right? And I think uh, the reason why I say this is, you know, Jason, this is our, you said our second conversation together. You know, hopefully we have a third. I, I enjoy talking to you, but if I could predict the market, I probably wouldn't be on these anymore, right? It becomes very, very hard to do. Uh, I would be somewhere else with, with my kid and my, my wife on a beach. It'd be a lot easier. My life would be a little bit easier than it is today. And so that's why I would say building your investments based off market forecasts is is difficult. And so it detaches from the individuality of your investment portfolio. And so that's kind of how I would build my portfolio overall. Um, you know, should you build it more conservative because of the tech stock bubble? If your goal is short term and you don't have a lot of risk tolerance, then it makes sense. But just because it's in a forecast it becomes really hard. Uh, and I think anyone who tried to buy a house in the early 2000s, the 2010s, had different experiences based off forecasts, right? And I think you might miss out on your goal by waiting for something to occur. Um, so it's very difficult to predict the future. But if, we, if any of us could do it with any level of accuracy, we probably would be a lot richer today. That's that. That is true. There's no one size fits all, and if it was easy, we'd all be doing it. We all we'd be all on a beach somewhere with our loved ones. You got that. You got that right. All right, Jonathan. We're gonna have to leave it there. Uh, we appreciate you, you taking the time and sharing your top considerations for uh, getting a personalized portfolio off the ground. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the viewers here today? Yeah, I think you know we started off by saying things in investing can be very, very hard and things can be very, very easy. There's a lot of information. I, I think what I would want to leave with everyone is to implore thinking about your investment plan first and foremost. And then there's a ton of tools. You, you've already mentioned a few uh, on this broadcast, Jason. Uh, and then work towards investing. Like the gym, the first investment is usually the hardest. I think it's building practice, building commitment, and things will get easier over time. Um, so... It's not as hard as it may seem, and it's, it's sometimes not as easy, but being committed is the best way to move forward and getting to your investment goals. All right, great. All right, thanks again for joining us, Sarnathan. And for those in our audience, make sure to register for our upcoming live webinars and check out our library of on-demand content, which is available on the Learning Center and on our YouTube page. We'll see you all next time. Have more questions? Check out the links to the right and in the description below.